Well, our purpose today will be to polish the jewel of redemption. We shall take some of the precious things of the gospel and seek to show how precious they really are. It has been well said that the gospel contains such blessed and wonderful realities regarding our status in Christ that when they are clearly seen that men are often reluctant to reach forth and take hold of them because they're, such, they're so wonderful in nature. Oh, how great is thy goodness, Amen. the psalmist said, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, for them which trust in thee before the sons of men. And then you recall the word of the prophet Isaiah where he said, I have not seen, and ear hath not heard, and neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed them unto us by his spirit. Amen. Now I'm going to read this passage. We're in Romans chapter 3. I'm going to read this context because... It's, we, we need to see the context in order, in this case, in order to fully appreciate what we're talking about. This is propitiation through faith in Christ's blood. We're going to start in, in verse uh, 21 of chapter 3 of Romans. <clears throat> but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith, in Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Whom, and here's our text, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. Amen. Now you may wonder why we're going to talk about the righteousness of God, but this you see this matter of the, of the, the propitiation through faith in the blood comes it comes to us in the container of this, in the context of this righteousness. See, so that's, and, and that's why I'm talking about this. So just bear with me for a while. This is something that is revealed in the gospel, Amen. the righteousness of God. It has been manifested in the present age, the righteousness of God without the law. Amen. Now there are folk, there are religious folk that, uh, that they know somewhat of the righteousness of God, but we're going to talk for a moment about the righteousness of God without the law. Amen. This kind of righteousness is beyond the grasp of those who are of legalistic mindset. Amen. Pharisees and Sadducees just do not think this way. The righteousness of God without the law. It is high and they cannot attain unto it. Amen. Now, incidentally, the only kind of divine righteousness that the, that the legalist mindset is able to relate to is that which is enforced upon men by means of law. And I guess that's a good starting point. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. We don't despise that. And even in the best of men, there is a tendency to drift into this direction. Men do not naturally think of the righteousness of God without the law. Amen. And we must be careful to add that we are not deprecating the law of God when we speak this way. The law is holy, and the commandment is holy and just and good, and the law is spiritual. Amen. But the law is not of faith. Amen. That's what Paul said there in Galatians. The law is not of faith. The law, it was by means of the manifested righteousness of God without the law that men are enabled to have a living hope and are ensured a place in the world to come. The law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. Amen. 
Let's get right into our text here in, in Romans chapter 3 and verse 25. And we'll, you will see that this matter of the righteousness of God uh, comes up again and again here. Whom God has set forth, that's Christ Jesus, to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Now, there's a lot in that text. Amen. Now, I just want to read some of the other uh, translations here to show, show you the consistency of this thought here. And I would also uh, draw your attention to the fact that most of the other translations, instead of the word remission, as the King James uses, use the word passing over. And I'm going to make this point. Almost consistently, all of the other standard translations talk about passing over sins, not remitting sins in this, in this context here, in this verse. And I'll make my point in a minute. The New King James Version says, Whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. And the New Inter International Version says, God presented him that is Christ, as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. See, that's, the new, that's another way of saying passing over. And then in uh, the... Uh, incidentally, this is significant because God did not leave the, the transgressions of the angels that sinned unpunished. Now, see, this is the, the backdrop. Amen. You've got to see that this is the backdrop of what the apostle is saying here. See, God is, he is very much interested in declaring his righteousness, but in the backdrop is another situation uh, that, that is brought into consideration here. God did not leave the transgressions of the angels that sinned unpunished. He spared them not, and cast them down to hell, or Tartarus, if you please. The, the Revised Standard Version says, Whom God put forward as an expiation by his blood to be received by faith, this was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. Behold the goodness and the severity of God, as Paul said. Now, reading in Moses and the prophets, one would draw the conclusion that God is quite severe. I mean, you read back there in Exodus and Leviticus, and, and you see some of the times when, when the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, God uh, dealt very severely with them. Behold the goodness and the severity of God. But some have blasphemously charged that the God of the Old Testament, quote unquote, was a dirty old man. I don't I, I hope you'll bear with me. Now this this charge has actually been brought by by blasphemers because because they, they, they were ignorant. They were ignorant and unlearned men. And they and they, they look back there at the way God dealt with sins back there and they said that that well that was the God of the Old Testament. The God isn't like that anymore. But God's severity with men must be compared with his severity dealt to the angels that sinned in order to get the proper perspective. Amen. When the angels sinned, God spared them not, and yet our race continues to this day as a monument to his mercy and grace Amen. and long-suffering. Now, just think, the people that are sitting in this room, or we can go to the whole city of Joplin or the state of Missouri, or you could go, I mean, the very fact that members of our race are continuing today, this day demonstrates, you see, it demonstrates actually what God is doing in redemption because there, were, there was another race that was immediately cast from his presence. Amen. And multitudinous representatives of this race shall be the heirs of salvation having been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. 
American Standard Version, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to show his righteousness because of the passing over of the sins done aforetime in the forbearance of God. In order for the, and here's my comment, in order for the blessed effects of, of propitiation to be realized by the individual, faith in Christ must be had in possession. Amen. New American Amen. Standard Version. Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith, this was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed mm -hmm. by the members of our race. Mm -hmm. Here's Weymouth. He it is whom God put forward as a mercy seat, rendered efficacious through faith in his blood in order to demonstrate his righteousness because of the passing over in God's forbearance of the sins previously committed. And then one final one, Moffat, whom God put forward as the means of propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to demonstrate the justice of God in view of the fact that sins previously committed during the time of God's forbearance had been passed over. Okay, let's go back to our text again whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Whom there is Christ, of course. Now, whereas under the law, the propitiation for sins was contained in an ordinance of, sh of shadowy things, the sh of the shadowy things, the mercy seat, that was a shadow of heavenly things. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the whole concept of propitiation was contained in ordinances. But now, in the New Covenant era, brethren, propitiation is embodied in a person. Amen. Without, without exception, when you read about propitiation in the apostles' writings, it's, it talks about a person whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. And then uh, remember in, uh, in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2, and he is the propitiation for our sins. And then you remember in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 10, uh, here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. It's embodied in a person now. Propitiation is embodied in the person of the man Christ Jesus. Amen. Whom God has set forth. God is the provider and setter forth of the propitiation for sins. Amen. If it were not for him, there would be no propitiation. Amen. Christ is not the author of propitiation. He was the propitiation. Amen. And God set him forth. God set his only begotten son forth to be the propitiation. It is God who is on the initiative here. Amen. And because God is the one who is here setting forth the propitiation... Such things as prayer altars, penance, and the like are out of order and are more akin to the worship at Mount Carmel, Carmel, where they were flagellating themselves and trying to appease God by buffeting the flesh, see? That's out of order. This, sort, this, this is out of order in the New Covenant era. It's unacceptable. Actually, if you want to get technical, these individuals that are, are putting forth this kind of approach have gone in the way of Cain. You see, they're trying to offer up something else. They're trying to offer up the buffeting of their own bodies instead of just receiving the reconciliation that has been made once and for all. Now, God set him forth to declare his righteousness. God is righteous, and he would have remained so had he not declared his righteousness in this connection. But we see here somewhat of the heart of God in that he desired to make it known both to men and angels. Now, you remember Peter, in commenting on this, he was actually thinking back of the tabernacle. But in his epistle, remember, he talked about which things the angels desire to look into. Now, he was actually harking back to the, to the cherubim. Remember, they were, they were situated over the mercy seat, and they were, look, they were looking down at the mercy seat. And, and you see back... Uh, Back there in the, in the tabernacle, God had, had, uh, 
had put this form in there to show how that angels desire to look into these things. Amen. <clears throat> but now unto the principalities and powers is made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Amen. And God's righteousness in the matter of the forbearance of past sins is abundantly made known by the preaching of the gospel. I just want to show you that, you see, when, when men preach the gospel, there is definitely a benefit that is reaped by the men that hear. And, and to be sure, by the, it's by the foolishness of preaching that God has ordained to save them that believe. But, but see, even more than this, God is declaring his righteousness. Amen. His righteousness is being declared, that God was actually righteous in saving us. Amen. In the very act of covering sins, by means of the shedding of Christ's blood, God was declaring his righteousness. And it was in this connection that he declared it. It was not characteristic of him to leave the sins of his creatures unpunished. When angels sinned, God did not simply upbraid them and chasten them from time to time for what they had done. He, he cast him down to hell. No questions asked. He cast him down. And thus his righteousness de demanded a proper adjudication of the matter regarding man's transgressions as well. Amen. The sins of Adam's offspring must forthrightly and unmercifully be punished for God's righteousness demanded that it be so. Thus, the setting forth of Christ as the great sin bearer and covering for men's sins before the multitudes of personalities in both heaven and earth had the blessed effect of clearing God of any impropriety in his forbearance of men's sins that were committed in the past and yet that went apparently unpunished. Can you see that? When men who were created in the image of God sinned, God did not consign them hope hopelessly per to perdition, but rather from the beginning began to make known a remedy for sins, which he himself which gracious, would graciously provide. Amen. And this was the remedy that could only come by the shedding of Christ's blood. It was a remedy that would prove to be the blessed covering for men's sins. Amen. The setting forth of God's only begotten Son as the propitiation for sins points to God's desire for men to feel comfortable in and delight in his presence. Amen. In his presence is fullness of joy, as Sister June just read, and at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. But that is because of the blessed covering for sin. You see, in our own right, there could be no blessedness about being in God's presence. I mean, if you're going to come to God in your own merits, that this, could not, this would not be a blessed situation at all. We would, we would be just like those in the Revelation that were crying for rocks and mountains to fall on them. Right. You see, of our own right, we are, not, we, are of not, we are not of such a nature to be comfortable in God's presence. So what made the difference? It was the blood of Jesus Christ Amen. that cleanses us from all sin. Now the setting forth of Christ as a propitiation for sins had at least a twofold purpose. Number one, it was to declare God's righteousness in remitting the sins that were past, or using the other translations, in passing by. See, he passed by the transgressions that were past. I mean, we still have the members of our race that, that are still, they're, we're still, they're still candidates for his salvation and mercy even if they haven't, re haven't received it. Potentially, they are. Amen. It was to declare God's righteousness in passing by the sins that were past. And number two, it was also to declare his righteousness in justifying those who believe in Jesus. Amen. The act of setting forth Christ as a propitiation served the primary purpose of declaring God's righteousness, the setting forth of this propitiation through faith in Christ's blood had the marvelous effect of providing a blessed remedy 
and covering for men's sins. And if God is this concerned with his righteousness being declared with regard to our salvation, then men ought to have a vital in interest in this as well. Amen. Amen. I mean, uh, <clears throat> we've mentioned this before, but you know, when it, with some men's regard for uh, the receiving the benefit of God, they're just happy if they receive it. I mean, as long as I receive it, then everything's fine, see? But no, we want to rise up higher than that. We want to have a, a higher view of the situation than that. We want to be concerned that this salvation was built upon a rock foundation. Mm -hmm. You see that God was just. He was, ju he was both just and the justifier. He wasn't just the justifier. Amen. You see that in our... And in borrowing this uh, language from the uh, Sermon on the Mount there, the, our God, when he, when he was devising this salvation, he was like the wise man who built his house Amen. upon the rock. Amen. You see, if, if, if he was not just in justifying us, then, that, then, it would, then our salvation would have been built on a sandy foundation. That's right. Amen. How we would not have any hope of eternal life. I mean, this thing could crumble to the ground at any moment. But know what I'm saying, that he is both just, he is both just and the justifier, not just the justifier, but he's just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, propitiation speaks of a divinely provided covering for sin and iniquity. This is the blessed covering for sin through Christ's blood, whom, the, whom God himself has set forth and provided. Now let's think about the, the blessed effects of propitiation. You know, propitiation has its experiential aspects as well as its legalistic, its legal aspects. Amen. And we want to be conversant with both of these. Wherever sins are covered by the Savior's blood, even God no longer sees them. I see no transgression in Jacob. How can that be? I mean, we're, this is, we're talking about the, uh, the eyes of him with whom we have to do. All things are naked and open before the eyes of him with whom we have Amen. to do. Now, how can it be that God does not see them? Well, that's because, they're, because this propitiation has effectually covered them. Amen. And God cannot, God, not even God sees them. Amen. When transgressions are covered, even the Holy One no longer remembers them. And when, it, when iniquities are covered, they are no longer imputed to the ones that had committed them. Amen. And when sins are propitiated, the children are judicially freed from sins. Amen. And when sins are covered, they are covered past, present, and future. Amen. Now, what kind of a salvation would that be if God only covered the sins that were past? I mean, you'd come up out of the baptismal waters and you would be liable to, to the pit and condemnation the first time you sin. Now behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world, not just the past sin, but all of the sin. He's taken away all of the sin. Now shall we sin that grace may abound? Grace might abound. God forbid. God forbid. Now, in all three places where this word appears in the apostles' writings, as we've mentioned, the propitiation is said to be embodied in a person, that of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Regarding this propitiation, Christ himself is the blessed covering for sins. And because of this propitiation, God is now wonderfully satisfied that sins are taken away. Men, especially them that believe, are now marvelously dissociated from their sins, and angels have been given to comprehend more of the fullness of God's working in Amen. salvation Amen. through faith in his blood. Now, the setting forth of this propitiation was the working of God who has purposed all things after the counsel of his own will. Faith is the response of men to this divine working in counsel. As he said in Isaiah chapter 46, declaring the end from the beginning and the end from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Amen. Now, I stand before you today, brethren, to declare and affirm 
that this propitiation for sin shall stand and that it shall abide into and throughout the ages to come. Amen. Because it was God's pleasure to do it. The scriptures declare that it pleased the Lord to bruise him. And he that spared not his own son, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? Amen. Now let us take note here of the word faith as it's employed here through faith in his blood. It is used in the sense of having complete confidence and trust in an object. And while it is certainly, certainly true that faith generally involves the belief of scriptural testimony, as we've been taught, uh, yet that same sacred testimony is testifying loudly of unseen realities upon which men are to put their complete trust and reliance. I mean, what good would the scriptural testimony do if it didn't summon you to have confidence in God Amen. and to have confidence in Christ and to have confidence in his salvation and to have confidence in his blood, see? I mean, what good would the testimony do? But see, that, was the, that is the reason for the testimony. It's summoning you to have confidence in God. Faith in his blood. This is not merely a professed faith and not only a confessed faith, but this is faith that, is in, that implicitly relies upon the shedding of Christ's blood. It reasons in this manner. If this blood had not been shed, then I would be lost. And if this blood had not been offered, then I would be falling into the hands of the living God. And if this blood had not been shed, I would not be cleansed from my sins. And without the shedding of this blood, the hope of eternal life would be forever dashed in pieces. As it is written, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And without remission of sins, there can be no salvation, no redemption, no sanctification, no hope of heaven and of the world to come. Amen. Now I affirm today that there indeed has been a shedding of precious blood, and that to which the God of heaven has a blessed regard. Amen. Christ has entered into the holy place with his own blood, now to appear in the presence of God for us, and God is now satisfied that sins have been put away by his only begotten Son. When it comes to the matter of men considering the blood of Christ, they must, to use a literary expression, put all their eggs in one basket. The very fact that Christ's blood was shed for sins points to the sobering reality that there was no other way for men to be saved. Amen. There was no other way. I mean, if there could have been another way, God would have taken that way. See, God is not, he is not a, a, an extravagant type God. He, see, he doesn't do more than what's necessary. Amen. And yet what he did was very abundant, but, but it was a but what he did was absolutely essential for our salvation. Amen. In the gospel age, we find men hanging all their hopes for salvation and deliverance from this present evil world on the blood of Jesus. This blood speaks of violence that was done to the Son of God so that sins could be put away. It speaks of an innocent life that was offered up in the behalf of others. It speaks of Christ losing something so that men might gain something. Amen. This blood washes away sins. It washes and cleanses the ones who committed them. And it removed transgressions far from us and from the face of God. This blood purges the conscience from dead works to serve the living God, and the blood of Jesus Christ effectually covers sins and removes them from the glaring view of the divine scrutiny. Amen. Now you remember, that as the prophet said, our iniquities like the wind have carried us away. But now the blood of Jesus Christ has washed them away. See, before we were carried away, and now they're washed away. See, so that's, that's, that's a good exchange there, too. Now, by the way, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us that are saved, it is the power of God. 
The effectual rehearsing of that bloody scene at Goth Golgotha will, when pr properly considered, persuade you that your sins have, in fact, been put away. Amen. I mean, that's what the preaching of the cross is all about. Amen. It's the rehearsing of, of the breaking and the bruising of our Lord's body. See, and in the rehearsing of that, you actually will be inward, if you, if you give heed to it, you actually will be persuaded that, yes, my sins are gone, my sins have been imputed to another. But see, it's, a, it's by the preaching of the cross and, this, and submitting to it. Now, when we speak of the blood of Christ, we are not only speaking of the blood that was shed by the Son of God, and that being the end of the matter. For if that were the end of the matter, the blood would not be of any profit to us who stand continually need a, in need of cleansing today. Christ has now entered into, the, into heaven itself with his own blood. Amen. You see, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of theology there that just, they just view the, you know, the scene at Golgotha, and that's the end of the matter. They, they don't have this vision of, of what Christ is doing right now. But see, he entered into the holy place Amen. with his own blood. Amen. Amen. And he's making intercession there Amen. for us with his own blood. Yes, he is. And that, that, that has an effectual ministry to us right now. See, as the, as the great high priest and mediator between God and men, with his own blood, he's entered into the holy place once for all. The shedding of Christ's blood, it means that now, that, that sins are now in fact gone, they are washed away, they have been removed far from us, as the east is from the west, it means that believing men and women, boys and girls, are washed from their sins. They are justified. They are sanctified. It means that they have been made worthy of heaven because they have been justified from all things from which they could not be justified by the law of Moses. Amen. Now, the old serpent, he is a minister of reassociation. You see, the, uh, the blood of Jesus Christ has made a dissoci dissociation between you and your sins. It really has. And as you, as you believe the record which God has given of, your son, of his son, then you will be persuaded of that as well. The old serpent does fervently attempt to reassociate those sins which have been removed and remitted with the ones who had once committed them even though God no longer sees them. He said, I, I see no transgression in Jacob. But this is man's infirmity. See, and I, I'm not making excuse for men that are unbelieving. Don't, don't misunderstand me. If, if men are unbelieving, well, then they can drift back into this state where, where it's an uncomely state. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Amen. Let's think about this righteousness again. This is particularly so regarding his forbearance of the sins that were past. When the angels sinned, we, as we said, God spared them not, but cast them down into chains of everlasting darkness. But when men san, sinned and came short of the glory of God, God was forbearing and began announcing the coming of a Savior, beginning in Genesis chapter 3. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. Now, when we speak of the forbearance of God, we are saying that God does not become accustomed to the, pre to the presence of sin in his creation. Amen. Now, see, this is something that is easily glossed by man, and it's easily glossed by us as well. It's, I mean, it's easy to drift into this mindset where you where you become and I become accustomed to the presence of sin. But God never gets accustomed to it. So that, that always calls his forbearance into play. Amen. See, God, God, the edge is never knocked off of God's forbearance. See, it's always, it's an always a strong, it's always a strong characteristic of God. It's, when, it's always called into play when men sin, his forbearance. He endured with much long suffering the vessels that were fitted unto, unto destruction. That was his forbearance. 
And remember, Paul, Peter said regarding us, he says, an account that the long-suffering of God is salvation. That's toward us, see, that's forbearance, see, that's while we, while we still have this liability of sin, see, this matter of forbearance is called into play. Not so in the world to come, that will, that will be something that is past. It will be no longer uh, necessary for God to, to have forbearance towards us. And regarding uh, the forbearance of God, speaking as a man, he is exceedingly affected and must either cast sin from his presence or forbear it for, a, for the appointed time by himself, the time appointed by himself. He forbear the sins that were passed, not out of a weakness on his part, Amen. as some would charge, but rather knowing that he himself was going to provide the blessed covering for sins through his beloved son. Amen. As we said before, in ages past, God was not noted for forbearing and enduring sins. I mean, before the creation of man, you won't find any record of this sort of thing happening. But he forbear the sins of Adam's offspring out of his love for his lost creatures until the time that Christ would come and bear them away. He endured them until the time that Christ would endure the cross, despising the shame. And he endured them in the prospect of finally bringing many sons to glory. Now, incidentally, someday the forbearance of God will give way to his vengeance and wrath. That day is coming. I'm talking about the ungodly now. See, right now, the, the ungodly men and women that are living in this world, God's, his forbearance is called into play with regard to them. But see, someday, the, the forbearance of God is going to give way and give rise to the wrath of God. The wrath of God will fall upon them who do not receive the, the reconciliation which he has graciously provided. He says in Romans 3.26, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. At this time, He's going to declare it at this time, that he might declare at this time his righteousness. For four millennia of time, his righteousness in this connection remained undeclared. The time immediately following the expulsion of our first parents from the Edenic Garden was not the right time for this declaration. And the time of the giving of the law at Mount Sinai was not the right time. And the time of the law and even of the prophets was simply not the right time. Now he's going to declare his righteousness, and that's what's happened. When the, when the gospel, God's righteousness is declared, not his righteousness in general or as an abstract quality. Uh, oftentimes in the Psalms and elsewhere, God's righteousness is considered in this general sort of way. Like in Psalms 11 there, it says, The righteous Lord loveth righteousness. Now he's talking about righteousness in all respects. He loves all, all aspects of righteousness. God loves them. But see, when Paul talks about declaring God's righteousness, he's not talking about his righteousness in general. He's talking about his righteousness as it has a particular application. Amen. You see, God, it, it appeared that God was unjust in providing a covering for sin. I mean, that's the way it appeared to, to angels. I'm talking about, we're not, maybe not to men, but, but this is how it appeared to angels. It appeared that God, I mean, God was covering sins. Think about it. God was covering sins. You've got to think about that, what God was doing. Now, when men tried to cover sins, think about when men tried to cover sins. Think about Cain when he tried to cover sins. Now, here we have God covering sins. And it appeared, it appeared like he was unjust. I, I didn't know, they, I'm not saying the angels did not bring a charge against God. That's not what I'm saying. The holy, the holy angels knew God well enough that they, they knew that he, he was righteous. But see, he, th this, it was not declared. It was not openly declared until our sins were laid upon Christ. That was the declaring of God's righteousness for past, present, and future. See, it, it, it showed that God was righteous even, even remitting the sins of our 
You know, back there in the, from the Garden of Eden all the way on, that God was righteous in doing that. Amen. It declared his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. Now, he said there are many religious devotees who are not at all concerned with whether God is righteous or not in, in, the, in this matter. As long as they're receiving the benefit, they're happy. The gospel is a declaration not only of men being made just and righteous before God, but also of God being abundantly demonstrated and declared to be just in his making of men just. Amen. Shall not the judge of all the earth be proven to be blameless in his justification of sinners? Amen. See, and, that, and, and this is abundantly made plain in the gospel, yes. that the judge of all earth, is he is blameless in his justification of sinners. This is built Amen. upon a rock foundation, brethren. Amen. This is built upon the solid foundation of sins having been effectually washed away yes. by the blood of Christ. He is just and the justifier. It is God that justifieth. And who can justify like him? Amen. Would, you, would you rather have anyone else to be your justifier? Had you ever thought about that? Now, we certainly would not want the old serpent to be our justifier. But how about some, even some of the Old Testament saints, the old covenant saints? Would you want them to be your justifier? No, it is God that justifieth. And who is better to just who who is better suited to justify than him? It is he with whom we have to do, it is he against whom we had sinned, and it is he who had enjoined the law's requirement upon us when we were yet under the school schoolmaster. And now in the gospel age it is God that justifieth. Well, I hope you were able to, to get some th something out of these things. I'm just going to read this text one more time, and I'll just leave you with these thoughts then. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. May God add his blessing to the reading Amen. of his word. Amen. Amen.